I'm been feeling a little bit old lately, and I'm getting really sick of uh, uh, just making these videos on details of financial models. So I'm going to. Uh, I've, I've received encouragement even from some crazy people who say I should write this second book that I started and stopped and started and stopped and started and stopped. And, you know, here, here, here's my story. I, when I began, I, I began this book years and years ago, and I believed in people like Merton Miller, Harry Markowitz, William Sharp, Fisher Black, Myron Scholes, Eugene Fama. These it all had associations with the University of Chicago, I should throw throw that in. They were my heroes. But then I started to realize I might have something to say. Because in the 70s and 80s, I, 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 I tried to apply the cap in. And I wanted to figure out, when I was a banker, I wanted to figure out exactly what these investment bankers do when they figure out, use their magic to figure out the terminal values and comparable companies. And then I started reading way too much. I read books. I did this testimony in front of these hearings. And when I did this testimony, you had to get everything right. You had to check everything. So if somebody in the beta calculation said we've got mean reversion of the beta by two-thirds and one-third, I had to go and find the 1974 article where they did that, which was never, ever updated, and, and figure out if it was okay or not. And then, of course, I worked as a banker, and then I made so many stupid models, I can't even count them. I, I have seen the financial crises because I'm so old. I try to figure out what's going with credit spreads all the time. And by far the most important thing is I've had the luxury of teaching wonderful people all around the world who've really pointed out stuff. And here's what I've come to the conclusion of, to. I've come to the conclusion that so much of finance is just crap. Some of it's not. Some of it really is not. But the, so much is. And I'm going to write this book. And when I'm, I'm writing this book, I'm going to kind of use case studies. The first thing I'm going to criticize in this uh, video right now is that anybody who thinks the risk premium, the market equity market risk premium, is anywhere near six percent, has got it, it, it's it, this is the number that's at the root of so much in finance, and it's so wrong. And then I'm gonna, you know, later I'm gonna make videos. My son said, my older son who's not in finance, and make a video occasionally about a case study. They'll be more interested in that than. Stuff and said, so, you know, I'm gonna also make a video on why if if debt has a, is, is a sold put option, which downside risk and no upside risk, and equity you can diversify equity and get a, with a wonderful diversified portfolio basically get the overall economic growth. You might have to go through little periods of ups and downs. Why? Would you say that the cost of capital, the cost of, uh, of equity is always higher than debt? What a runs are ridiculous. And then I criticize the WAC. I've done that. The basic one minus tax in the WAC formula is wrong. You can prove it. And then I've gone through terminal value calculations. I'm going to use a case study to demonstrate that. And this idea, oh my God, this idea that... Buying beer in, in Nigeria is riskier than buying beer in Switzerland. That we have more volatility of people buying beer in, in Nigeria. And we should charge a much, much higher risk premium for beer or food or, or biscuits or anything else. What crazy. And then, the, of course, the, the McKinsey value driver formula do, doesn't really work unless you make some absurd kind of calculations and this McKinsey thing, which is supposed to be the Bible of finance. Oh, my gosh. And in this McKinsey, they say earning a monopoly profit, high returns above your cost of capital is really good for society. <laughs> and how can we even measure return on invested capital? I'm going to go through that. Risks for a corporation can, are not stable over time, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to do a lot more stuff, you know, in the uh, beta on debt. 
uh, on the, you can compute the beta on assets by assuming a debt beta is zero. All of this stuff is so wrong, and you just list one after the other, after the other, after the other. Now, I've decided to make this, to, 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 to work on my book using some case studies, and my favorite case study. My favorite case study of all time by far is this Enron case study, where the Harvard people thought it was so wonderfully fantastic. And here's what happened to Enron's stock price. I better have put this stock price somewhere in here, because it's hard to get the stock price, you know? And, you know, look at this from 2000. It was 1.5, and then by the year, you know, 2001, it doubled to three. You doubled your money, and it started going down, and then it went down to zero. Oof. Okay, and here's the, and they make these idiotic diagrams with no, no uh, uh, arrows or anything else. And I just kind of collect old data and uh, what have you. There's a picture of the power plant. If you say this power plant should be three times the cost in India than it would be in the UK, why? It's the same plant workers are less why would it cost three times as much of course you're building in profits all the time <laughs> what kind of things are you doing for the country when you do this so then i have people here i race straight to the ppa and have them use the read pdf and, and uh, compute the uh, i hope i have them and i'm not sure i put this uh, uh, thing in here I hope I have them compute the uh, uh, IRR. But this is why I opened this case. So what I'm doing is going through these cases. And can you imagine Harvard? They said their company, Enron Development, a great company. The development had been attempting entry to the huge Indian market, Indian market. EDC was headed by Rebecca Mark of Harvard. It's youthful, energetic presidents. She summed up her philosophy as follows. We are eclectic bunch with ex-military and some ex-entrepreneurs. This is just so classic. We're brought together with a certain amount of, read that carefully, missionary zeal, which I think you have to have in this business. Man, so much of your time, you really know what you're doing. And I think this missionary zeal has three parts. First, the projects have to be good for the country. We're just taking a gigantic IRR out of the country. Ah! Uh, second, the plants have to be economically safe. And third, this is the this is the one. And third, I have not said this. We're bringing a market mentality and spreading the privatization gospel in com in countries that desperately need this kind of thinking. Now, I am not at all making any accusation. I'm just repeating something that again some, one of my students said. <laughs> I'm going to work for Enron. He said, well, to bring this privatization gospel to people, they, they happen to, well, they paid him a little money to, for this. Okay, and then I put all these articles you can see and try to say, work through how they're, where they're making money and a fee in the, in, 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 on, on the, a fee on the fuel, uh, profit on the EPC, uh, uh, Profit on the O&M, a, a basic profit from the SPV and uh, 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 risk guarantee and all of that. And you go through this and the IRR is really, really high. And this is the whole thing. What's a fair IRR? What's the cost of capital? And so I started writing this stuff up. And why I think the foundation of the cost of capital perhaps one of the most important things in all of finance. Look, I've just kind of done this. So I go through an introduction to the case. I'm going to write it up and not go through too much of it, not say much more than I ha have. But now I want to go through what the most reasonable cost of capital is. Now, this man named Professor Sharp won the Nobel Prize for saying that cost of equity in a capital asset pricing model, he proved that in an elegant way is 
proved <laughs> is equal to the risk-free rate, and people usually use a 10-year year treasury uh, for this, plus beta times this equity market risk premium, assuming you can get that. Now, this equity market risk premium, this is the biggest number Somebody said it. I can't remember exactly what when I was reading this stuff when I used to be testifying. Somebody said, well, this number is the biggest number in all of finance. And I tend to agree. Okay. But the problem is that it's an unmeasurable number because it, the definition of cost of capital is, number one, that you, it's, it's the minimum return that you would accept. It's the expected return. Minimum expected return that you would accept given the risk. It's got minimum in there and it's expected. You can't know what the cost of capital is. Okay, and there are all these, of course, long things in this Dr. Demorodan. I can Demorodan. He every he publishes all this stuff in his website. You've gone to it, and it's pop, most popular. My students in one of my online classes said, oh, there was a Deloitte person who was speaking with me. Oh, if you want to learn valuation, you go to this website. And he says that the equity risk premium is 5.58. 5.58. And let's see about this. Now, another thing, and I have to pause the video for just a minute. Now, when I, one of my favorite targets is this valuation book, and I've said many times before, I've read this three or four times, the first time I thought it was really good. Oh, it taught me everything. You have to earn more than your cost of capital and grow the business. Ah, what an illuminating idea. And then... As I reread it and reread it, the second thing, what is, well, it doesn't really say that much. They talk about the authors and everything else, and they talk about how wonderful earning a high return on invested capital is. They talk about how wonderful that is in all of this introduction stuff, which I reread. Again, the fundamental principles of value creation and all this, and why this is good for everybody in the whole economy if we earn a big, big high return on the cost of capital and why the U.S. is so much better than any other country because of here, the, 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 because whatever, they do so much, have a higher return than Asia and all of that stuff. Then they talk about stock market performance and they keep talking about TRS, total I guess TRS must be total returns to shareholders. That's IRR. That's what this man, this man from Oxford at the Amsterdam Institute of Finance, where I taught for 20 years, I don't teach there anymore. What an idiot to say that the TRS, the rate of return, the IRR, the growth rate in your money is bullshit. That's what he said. How can that be? Everybody, the whole economy is founded on growth and the total returns to shareholders is just the IRR if you invest, make an investment, get dividends, and then sell your stock to say the IRR is bullshit. What an idiot. Sorry. Okay. Oh, this is good because I get to kind of get a heart attack and all of this. Now I've got to, I think I've got to uh, uh, turn it, uh, pause it one, one more time. So this book quoted somebody named, I should know who he is, Jeremy Siegel. Oh, he's one of these people from Ibbotson. They used to have an office in my building when I had a bankrupt company. Uh, uh, the origins of the 6.5% inflation adjusted total, total return to share, shareholders comes from blah, blah, blah. 6.5% inflation adjusted return to shareholders. That's what he said that people have earned over 70 years and, uh, uh, and blah, blah, blah. And I should find out exactly uh, 
where he says that, but this seems to imply may, maybe this is the total return and it's not the equity market risk premium. So actually the equity market risk premium from this 6.5% would, would certainly be less than that. And then they go through some, D, it's some PE ratios and gobbledygook to suggest that it's good that you earn a return of 74%, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now, I have said this before, so we'll go back to uh, 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 we'll go back to this one. Okay. Uh, I here's what I have done, and I've shown you this in the past, and I'm sorry about if it's a little bit repetitive. But I want to be careful in this video. Okay, so I have this thing called comprehensive stock price analysis. And instead of going to Bloomberg and everybody else, I go and get the data, number one, the raw data. And this is just fantastic. This is the nominal value of the S&P 500 from finance.yahoo.com. Now, maybe they have all of their data wrong. They go all the way from 1927, before the 1929 crash, and they bring it all the way to today. Okay, and then in addition to that, I go and I just plop this in. I made way too many uh, 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 videos on this. I'll get the DAX, the industrials then i'll get an inflation rate and the inflation rate has been published it's on an annual basis by this federal fr reserve federal reserve economic e f r e d database and a lot of people use that here's the cpi here's the euro and then finally i get the uh five-year treasury Bill, bill rate. But when I get the five-year treasury bill rate, I first uh, 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 take it and compute it, and, and, and I adjust it to be a monthly rate, and then I compute an index value. So the, the if you take the interest rate, if this I want to do it monthly, this is an annual rate, one plus the interest rate raised to tw one twelfth power minus one, and just just create an index. And then finally, I can get some, some corporate profits, after-tax profits, GDP, G, uh, 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 where, where was uh, GDP of the U.S.? And this is uh, shift, control F, let's see if that works. This is... Uh, seasonally adjusted rate, blah, 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 is a feature and measure of the market value of goods and services. And this is not, this is in billions of dollars, not in real, do, in, 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 in real dollars. This is in nominal dollars. So you can get this file, of course, but you're never going to use it because it's so much easier if you want to stock. You can just, you can just, uh, you don't have to, read it all in this has been a real failure in my life to do this but i think this this business of being able to then look and make little graphs and look at way long-term history and really kind of study things i just love it so and right now this goes back so if we i'm gonna click on this one i've, I've done this way too much and i hope you download this from my website and right now, if you reset the inflation and recalculate it, if just, I turn the calculation off. If you go back to 1927, no, 1953, let's go back all the way to 27. When you do this, you got to always kind of recalculate it. It tells you that after that, you had a bad year in, tw in, in 29, that's for sure. And then you hold it throughout the, the, were the, the, the Great Depression, the World Wars, the 87 crash, the disco period in, in the 70s, the, uh, uh, whatever, the, the Chicago uh, 
convention of 68, Mandela here, and whatever, the, 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 the layman collapse, the telecom bubble and the dot-com bubble. This is our latest little tiny thing that's hardly anything. Uh, you would have got 5% nominal terms if you would have started somewhere in the 90s when the internet started to come forget all this government uh, policy crap you know here don't worry about all that when if you would have done it in the 90s the return would have been this much and then you can of course do this for inflation and uh, adjust this for inflation and your inflated return from 94 you got big upswings and all of this stuff and all the politicians love these days to say you the stock price market is going up so you'll vote for them and all that stuff here's here's what's happened and let's figure out why this six percent this dumb or the 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 people from the uh, I have to find it, really. I'm going to uh, uh, rewrite it a little. This is helpful for me to, to, to kind of work through it. Uh, what they say in the McKinsey book to do, uh, if it's anything uh, uh, near 6%, you'd have to have your head examined. You could make a lot better argument that it's zero. I think you could make a really pretty good argument that it's just about zero. And here, but but let's let's uh, uh, start with uh, the numbers. This is so I just clipped some of these things that I showed you. Here's the here's the S and P from 1927, and then, uh, this is the real. Uh, uh, no, this this is since '93. I guess I did it '93 instead of '94. And then I start making a couple of comparisons. First thing I do is compare it to the five-year and the 10-year treasury. And I do it for the recent period. And it is true, stocks have had a higher return than the 10-year. The higher one's the 10-year, the lower one's the five-year treasuries. Is that a shock? That's not a shock, no way. All of these young people and all these doctors are so convinced they're going to be rich by throwing their money into something like the S&P 500 and they don't want to ever pay a broker and all that stuff. Fine, whatever. And if, But if you go earlier, if you take the earlier period, and I started in 53 because that's when I the, the interest rates started. If you go to the earlier period, there's no evidence whatsoever of a premium on stocks compared to bonds so whether these historic things have any meaning at all is 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 a really open question and then now i add this yellow line and i in if you want to see how i add these lines by clicking on a little button isn't that exciting i hope my investment my capex in all of this this excel stuff one day will pay off i don't know if it will the GDP, if you go back to the earlier period, the stocks didn't grow much differently than the GDP. And that's an interesting thing, is that eventually, unless the, the employees the employees are taking a bunch of money out of your company, you're, if your sales grow at about the GDP and if you've got a portfolio in just about every stock in the country, why shouldn't it grow at the GDP? That's kind of pretty that 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 makes sense doesn't it but where's the risk premium because also the 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 theory there's some man named fisher who said that the overall interest rate grows with the overall economy the real interest rate at least and i can't remember are these in real or, or, or nominal terms uh, these are in real terms and then I did a nominal, uh, no, this is in real terms. I uh, can't remember this one. I think this is in real terms, right, because it came down. This here, since 1993, in real terms, the growth in the S&P 500, why do you have to use this Jeremy, whatever his name was, 
you can get it from finance.yahoo.com. You can do this in a couple of minutes. Do this all yourself. Start questioning things. And this is, remember, only my first little piece of it. And I'll go get emotional and maybe nobody will watch any of this stuff. Watch play that, whatever. Okay. And here, if you want to do this, you're... You're kind of, you can figure out what the risk premium is for minus two, maybe two percent or whatever. If if it's the ten year, whatever. If, no, four minus three. It's a it's not a very high in real terms uh, 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 rate. But notice how the S and P 500 started growing a lot faster than the economic growth. So if you start here. By the time you're finished, and I was wrong with what I said. This was for the whole period. I, I, I'm really sorry. I've got to do this one just for the 93 period. Excuse me for doing that, for, for getting that wrong. So if we uh, let's make it 93, okay? And this is how you do this. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put everything in real terms and deflate by the GDP deflator. And then I'm going to start comparing it with some th some stuff. And the things I'm going to compare it with, and again, these come from the FRED, I'm going to pair, compare it with the GDP. And then, and it takes just a, a second. And I'm comparing it with the five year. And then I'm also going to compare it with the 10 year. Okay. That's all I do, and I, I'm just going to hit the recalculate button just in case. So since uh, 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 93, in real terms, the, the risk premium has indeed been higher, 5.25 versus 2.36 if you're using the 10-year, which is, again, an absurdly idiotic thing to use. So I better... Uh, Okay, I'll make a new one of these. I'm going to just plop this into my book. Now, the last time I, 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 I wrote the book, some they, had, they paid somebody to, to review my graphs, and it was a pain. Oh, God, I hope I don't. Oh, well, we'll see. I'll never get around to this, will I? Okay, now, before we look at this, Let's talk about why this risk premium of 6%, which probably Mr. AIF, Amsterdam Institute of Finance, likes this because he likes WAC. Mr. Well, what's the guy's name again? Uh, come on. What a waste that I just wasted your time with this. Uh, I can't find it. Mr. Pa Il Oh, God, I can't come close. Okay, the, uh, so here we are. Here we are after 93, and the return on stocks has been substantially higher than the return, the overall GDP. And you just measure everything with IRRs, Mr. Pablo Bernard. And you... Yeah, because that's the total shareholder return or whatever you want to call it. And that's the IRR. That's the, that's the growth rate in your money. That's how people get rich. Okay? And speaking of how people get rich, now before you say, ah, that's so good. The market went up. In the, I've been, you know, as, uh, staying in the U.S. And unlike other countries, the U.S., every day they talk about the stock market. And when it goes up, they play happy music. Ah, woo, 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 woo. But here's the real fact. 93% of the stock market is owned by the top 10% of people, and it's probably even more concentrated, whatever. So the, when they play this happy music, they're playing it for those rich people because when stocks go up, if you have any semblance of belief, any semblance at all of belief in efficient markets, the stocks reflect the profits that companies make, the cash flow that companies make. And if companies are doing better than the GDP, poor schlumps like me are doing worse. 
it's a, it's the, there's a GDP accounting that I'm going to even put in my little book that says, okay, what happens if you earn more than the cost of capital? What happens to the people who own stocks versus the poor schlumps that don't earn stocks? Okay, then you can say, oh, you're getting political, you idiot. You're getting political. No, I'm not getting political. I'm not getting political. The point I am making is that when this this stock market relative to the GDP changed so much, it's exactly, and I've had to look around for this, it's exactly when the income distribution started to change. So here's the middle. They only earn, they've only grown by 47. Here's the top 1%, 226. They don't have the, they, they have the kind of pretty high, the 20% people. They've grown better, and the real poor people have done okay. All right, that's good news. Okay, but look at this. Doesn't this look a lot like this? It, the time period is different. It's got the ups and downs. This was the, the down in, in the 2000 and uh, whatever, after the, the dot com. This was the 2008, and who knows what's happened after this. All right. The income distribution that is this political issues can be expressed as the stock market returns versus the GDP. That's my point. And I'm not making a political statement. No, I'm saying I am making... A, a, a statement about Mr. Damaratan and the McKinsey book, and anybody who is anything close to six percent in a a anybody who uses anything close to six percent in measuring the equity market risk premium would have to get your head totally examined. And here's another thing where the income, look at how the income used to be kind of everybody was going, doing okay. And there were people who've even said, ah, in the future great economy, the, we're going to have a decline in the distribution. But then starting here, especially around 1993 where I started, then it started widening. And you can make a pretty good argument that these people who are 93% of the stocks and when they earned all their cash flows and their profits and the rest of us didn't, well, who knows? Don't, you might think that I'm going to make a lot of my website or something, whatever. Okay. Now, and, and I didn't put the rest in. Here, here, is, here, is, here is my point. Okay. Now, what I have done next is I have taken 1993, and then what I've done is I said, okay, let's put a 6% return in here. And in your 6% return, uh, uh, um, let's, what am I doing? Just a minute. Oh, I'm, I'm way too low. Let's here put a little growth rate. Let's put an equity market risk premium of one in, and what I'm going to do, what I do is say, okay, take the, 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 the whatever, the 10-year yield, and add to that, and then divide it by the previous one so you get the growth rate and all that stuff. And, and put this monthly, this is, everything's monthly here. I get when I download from Yahoo and I download from what, what, a Fred, I always use monthly, so I, I put the a monthly return here, you know, the, one divide one plus the rate raised to the one twelfth power minus one, blah blah blah. So it gives you an annual return of six percent. So I'm not overstating because of monthly compounding or anything like that. And then you can see, well, what kind of return would you actually got if in nineteen ninety three you would have actually earned this six percent premium, this six percent hit premium, and look at this. Look at this. Here is how much you would have earned. All right. And I better now make a new uh, copy of this. I'm sorry I'm showing you the guts of this while I, while I do it. Okay. And that, okay, that, if here's why I made the point about the income distribution. The reason I made the point about the income distribution is, uh, is 
get some words out there, is that this, talk about a, a, for me, the real revolution in the world was the French Revolution. When the people stood up to those, to those, you know, cut the heads off of all those, those, what, whatever royalty who was just collecting all the money for not doing much. Now, can you imagine if, with all this talk and political discussion these days, every single minute in the news, can you imagine if the return would have been here instead of here? Can you possibly imagine what would happen? But this, this is the point. This is what financial theory tells you. And this is the key number. This is the most studied number in all of finance, and it is a completely crazy number. It's absurd. Can you just imagine what would happen if these few people who, own, who really own the stock market, these 93% of the people, instead of going up here, my gosh, what would that have been? What would this have been if they really did earn a 6%? I'm just trying, I'm not making, again, the political statement. I'm trying to demonstrate just what's behind some of this finance. And if they get this number wrong, all of that stuff about double power plant was so wrong. Expecting to, thinking, after you've got your MBA from Harvard, thinking that you somehow have a right to these really, really high returns and you can go steal it from these countries and everything else. Well, I, don't, I can say that now because people from Enron is, aren't there anymore, okay? And then, of course, if I go crazier, what if we go all the way back now to 1953 and when I started this stuff? And I really hope that one day one day you're going to download a couple of my files and <laughs> oh my gosh this is what an implication of a 6% equity mister the uh, uh, finance theory would be and if i haven't done, if you, somebody tells me i've done something wrong it's so crazy that i really kind of think oh i must have made an error somewhere it can't be right this just can't be right and Mr. Siegel and everybody else said that you're, you're earning these kind of returns. And, and here, here's one of the big lessons, by the way. One of the big lessons is a very small difference in return, which is compounded, and everything should be compounding. This business of arithmetic returns, what, what a bunch of crap this is. It's just crazy. Okay. This is the implication of finance. It just it, it can't happen. It cannot happen that you take so much more out of the economy than the economic growth. The real growth is about, this is about right, probably. From 1993 to, to 2008, you grow by productivity. You get back to some of your economic things and you try to put some things together. And that's just one of the things. So what I'm going to do is gradually start writing this thing, write it up. I'm going to put it on my website before I – probably nobody will publish it, but these days you can self-publish it at all because I'm – whatever. Maybe I'm not, not one of these famous people or something. And I'm going to go through other things. I'm going to try to make an argument. I think I can make one that it's totally possible – that the and, and not only possible, maybe even probable that the, 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 the cost of capital for debt is actually higher than the cost of capital for equity because you take downside risk, not upside potential, you take inflation risk and all the rest of it. Okay, and then I'm gonna go through all of this, every single all of these things that are wrong, so many things that are wrong, and people accept it. And I was totally afraid. I, I, was, I was a coward. I thought, oh, I can't do this. I'm gonna, people, I got to teach classes. I got to make a tiny bit of money because I'm in those, that blue, that, that, that yellow line. Or I don't want to be in that very, very low line. But I'm not afraid anymore. I'm going to keep doing it.